Hello everyone and welcome back to my advanced tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program. In this episode we are going to be talking about the Apollo mission and a Saturn V rocket. We are beginning in a mod install in KSP 1.1.3 and that is because I wanted to show you how the rocket operated in real life and so we are with the realism overhaul set of mods which turns Kerbin into Earth, gives us a realistic atmosphere and most importantly gives us real fuels and real engines. So if we take a look at these engines, this is the FASA pack uh, mod that provides us with the Saturn V. It's not really updated for recent versions of KSP, but there are many, many other mods with the Saturn V rocket, so you can take your pick. Uh, in this case, I'm much more used to working with this one. It has some glitches because it hasn't been updated, but those won't affect us in this video. So, this is the F1 engine. It is the engine on the first stage of the Saturn V. It has five of them, as you can see. And uh, with the Realism overall set of mods, it allows you to configure the engines to the proper version. It gives you the proper thrust. And so, that's what Realism overhaul is really all about. It has a proper thrust, and it also has the proper fuel. So, no longer are you using liquid fuel and oxidizer. Here we have kerosene and liquid oxygen on this first stage and you can see the thrust of the engines and the ISP and all of that. Also, Realism Overhaul limits the number of ignitions on the engines, something you don't have to worry about in the stock Kerbal Space Program. You can see that these engines can only be ignited once. Uh, another thing that is unusual about Realism Overhaul compared to stock is that the engines do not necessarily throttle. And in fact, the F1 engines do not throttle. Uh, so actually you'll see in the first stage they will shut off the center engine and if you've ever seen an Apollo mission they'll mention center engine cutout in order to limit g-forces. The second stage is in here and if you've ever seen the staging of the Saturn V rocket you'll note that the, this portion stages first and then the skirt separates afterwards and there is an iconic video of the skirt separation afterwards with a flaming uh, skirt there and if you listen to Apollo launches you'll hear skirt sep and that's that part there and here we have five J2 engines and so J2 engines well the, the, these aren't J2 engines I've added those configurations for other purposes but there are three configurations for the J2 engine and right now we're just using the normal J2. J2 does throttle and you can see that here but only to 76 percent and that was actually done by fuel flow regulation and uh, it burns hydrogen and oxygen so it's a cryogenic engine that's what when you hear the term cryogenic engine most often that is referring to liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen engines and those that engine mixture that fuel mixture gives you a higher ISP these engines have uh, 424. Uh, actually, I've seen 421 as well. Compared to the F1 engines down here on the first stage, which only had 304. So that gives you an idea of the benefit of hydrogen and oxygen. Though uh, the F1 engines were not particularly efficient uh, kerosene and oxygen engines, there are much more efficient ones. Hold on, let me get rid of this dialogue. So, on to, so that's the second stage. The second stage burns for six minutes. Um, I can show you the delta V stats. The first stage burns for two minutes and 45 seconds and provides 3,802 meters per second. The sea level thrust weight ratio is 1.14 in this configuration. This is a rather heavy configuration for the Saturn V. The, uh, that is for the later Apollo missions because they carried more stuff. Um, this stage is not reading its proper amount. You can see the second stage, uh, it burned for between 6 minutes and 6 minutes and 20 seconds. And you can see a very low thrust weight ratio and we'll talk more about that during launch. Uh, actually, uh, normally I remember that being more along the lines of 0.9, but we'll take a look. Okay, we need to go outside to be able to see the third stage, which is just a single J2 engine. And this is not reading the correct burn time here, which makes me suspicious. It's the right configuration. I think it's because of these APS pods, though. Uh, these APS pods are basically RCS pods uh, that uh, allow it to maneuver in space and make sure it's pointed in the right direction. And also, 
helps to settle the fuel down to start the engine. That's another feature of realism overhaul. You need to settle the fuel down to start the engine. We'll see that in action. Okay, and then the bits you're probably most concerned with. Uh, this is the, the Apollo capsule under here, but this is actually the launch escape tower. And it actually wraps around the capsule. You can see it's actually a shroud around the real capsule. This is the Apollo capsule. And when you put this together, uh, if you want it to be super realistic, this is the docking drogue. And underneath it would be the hatch that they would open. And uh, here is a protective nose cone uh, uh, because you want to protect the parachutes from re-entry heat. And so here we have the parachutes, main parachutes. Okay, so that's the pod. So you'd put the, the pod, the parachutes, the protective cap, and then the drug. And during uh, descent, you'd only pop open this after you get through the re-entry heat. Okay, after that, this is the service module. The service module had room for life support. It had room for RCS, obviously. A lot of it was filled with fuel for the main engine on the service module, the Apollo Service Propulsion System, which is an AJ-10-137. That's the type of engine. And it burned a totally different fuel than everything else, uh, well, than the lower stages. It's Aerozine and N204. And the reason it used that fuel is because it's storable and it doesn't need to be frozen or anything like that. It can, it can be uh, liquid in any temperature that this is likely to be in. So there is room for experiments here and that was used, uh, they actually uh, let go of some satellites around the moon along their way on certain missions and other than that uh, I think that just about says it all. It, uh, it, it carried a lot of equipment in there. And then here is the lander, and the lander is sort of nestled inside this uh, decoupler. You can see it sort of comes like that. So here you have the descent stage, and at the bottom of the descent stage is the descent module engine. And so this portion ignites during the descent, and then this is the ascent engine. It's better to leave this stuff behind. I didn't have the lander legs on, but it has lander legs as well, and so it's best to just leave the legs behind as well, instead of carrying them with you on the way back to orbit. Uh, you can see that the RCS isn't on this bottom part, it's only up here, and that means the RCS is better balanced for the way up than on the way down, and so the this descent engine, this engine gimbals. The ascent engine does not gimbal. The ascent engine is fixed. So keep that in mind. This engine does gimbal, the service propulsion system, and it also has a generous 36 ignitions, which is nice. Um, the engines on the lunar module are much more limited. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see the numbers uh, accurately on all of this because of the way it's placed. You can see that the service propulsion system really does have uh, usually between 2,800 and 3,000 meters per second depending on the mission, and that's accurate. Uh, even if we unlock the fuels here though, you wouldn't see it, well, uh, we have unlocked the fuels, it's just not showing it properly because it's staging. Um, it won't uh, read properly because it's pretending like the lunar module is carrying the the what you got um, command and service module so you're not gonna see the proper delta V's I'll just tell you the proper delta V's the proper delta V for the descent module for descending to on the moon is 2600 meters per second the ascent stage had 2200 in both cases this was quite generous which was a good deal because in the case of Apollo 11 of course Neil Armstrong spent about a minute hovering trying to find a good landing spot and that was afforded by the fact that uh, that the descent stage had 2,600 meters per second. So that is good. Now we're going to be doing this in stock KSP as well. So don't worry, I'm talking about how this is built, but we're going to turn to stock KSP and build one and I'll show you how that is done. But I wanted to show you how this works as far as realism overhaul and how it really looked like uh, in the Apollo missions. 
Uh, one little thing that I forgot to mention is this section here. This is the Saturn instrument unit. Goes right there. And that's the part that uh, had all the avionics and stuff to control the rest of the rocket. Uh, not the stuff to control the command and service module and the lunar module, of course. But that allowed the third stage here to be boosted. After it completed its job, they either uh, smashed it into the moon or boosted it into solar orbit to dispose of it. So there are actually, in some cases, some of the missions boosted to solar orbit, and in other cases, we left some debris on the moon. Okay, so here we are, and what you have here is a bewildering array of resources. And why don't I go through them uh, each at a time? Uh, in Realism Overhaul, you not only have ablator, but also charred ablator, and that's to ensure that there's some remaining mass on the vessel from the ablator. In other words, if this just goes away, then you start losing mass, and that starts unbalancing the thing. And so you should have some charred ablator to keep the mass there. Food, water, and oxygen, because we've got tack light support and carbon dioxide, waste, and wastewater. Uh, so oxygen turns into carbon dioxide, water turns into wastewater, food turns into waste. And so that's all tack light support. MMH and N204 are our RCS fuels. Um, but you'll note that we have a lot more uh, nitrogen tetroxide, N204, here. And that's because nitrogen tetroxide and aerozine 50 are our fuels for the service propulsion system and also the lunar module engines. So it's a little bit weird that the lunar module engines use aerozine and N204, but the RCS thrusters use MMH, monomethylhydrazine, and N204. Uh, it would have been probably better just to use aerozine and N204 for everything, but oh well. Uh, lithium hydroxide is used to take uh, clean out the carbon dioxide and turn some of it back to oxygen. Um, so that's a CO2 scrubber. And of course that was famous on the Apollo 13 mission because uh, the CO2 scrubbing is was an issue because they didn't have the systems working on everything. They needed to make sure they got the CO2 out of, out of their air. Electric charge, you know. HTPB is solid fuel, so those that's for like the launch escape system. Actually, I think that's only in the launch escape system. We've also got solid fuel here for separatrons. And PSPC is also for separatrons. That's also another solid fuel. Uh, liquid oxygen, well, that's used throughout the vehicle. It's the only oxidizer in the Saturn V rocket itself. The oxidizer in the Apollo service module and in the lander is the nitrogen tetroxide. Liquid hydrogen is the fuel for the second and third stage. Kerosene, the fuel for the first stage. TTEB is our ignition. It is our ignition fuel, igniter fluid, um, and it is solely for the F1 engines as you see, see there. Now, if you're trying to get to the moon, there are a few ways of going about this. Unlike in stock KSP in real life, the Earth is tilted by 23.5 degrees, which in realism overhaul means that the Moon is tilted by 23.5 degrees. That means that you're not always at the right inclination, well, you're not really at the right inclination to start off with anyway, but uh, you're not lined up particularly well to meet up with the Moon. You could launch at any time. Uh, but you're going to have to take a little bit more time to get there if you're in a particularly bad relative inclination. See, right now we have uh, 56.92 degrees, which is about as bad as it gets. And the way you would uh, meet the, with the moon if you just wanted to launch right now for some reason is to go out at your ascending or descending node, but your ascending or descending node might not, be, uh, might not make the trip short you could be taking as much as 14 days to get to the moon in that case. Um, if you do a Holman transfer and line up with the moon properly, you can get there in about two days. Uh, so what we want to do is limit the relative inclination. As it so happens, the Earth is tilted by 23.5 degrees. The moon is actually not quite in line with the ecliptic, which is the plane of the rest of the planets. The moon is off by 5 degrees. And so, Cape Canaveral, which happens to be at 28.6 degrees, happens to be exactly in line with the moon, or uh, plus or minus a quarter of a degree. So we can get the relative inclination if you're starting off at, at Cape Canaveral. Watch your hydrogen, if you're doing realism overhaul, watch your hydrogen just in case it boils off. You might need to turn on the fuel pumps. 
uh, so that the hydrogen doesn't boil off. But you can see our relative inclination going on. This is MechJeb. This is a mod that shows displays like this. You will want your relative inclination to display. Whoops. So you'll get uh, a minimum point once every day. The downside is that depending on the season, uh, your launch may be in the dark. And in this case, we are going to be launching in the dark. Anyway, uh, 0.5 degrees is fine. And in fact, we uh, with the Saturn V rocket, you have quite a bit of leeway to have a bad inclination and still make it work out. Okay, uh, we would like a little bit more ambient light. So that's another mod, ambient light adjustment. Don't worry, we'll do this all in stock and you'll see how it works there. But it is interesting to see it this way. Alright, SAS on, throttle is up. Smart ASS is part of MechJeb and I'm going to use it to show you exactly what kind of pitch I'm going to set during this launch. Uh, in case you want to try a real Saturn V launch, you can see what the flight profile I use is. And it's not ideal, but it works. So here we go, ignition. You have to wait for the engines to spool up in realism overhaul, and then launch. So they don't automatically go to full thrust immediately. So here I'm starting out the pitch program. Even though the Saturn V starts out slow, you'll see that it starts its pitch program relatively quickly. And that's because it picks up its uh, thrust to weight ratio rather, rather quickly. So I'm at about uh, 80 degrees at 3 kilometers. Gotta be at 70 degrees at 6 kilometers. When we pass the speed of sound, I'm at uh, 7.5 kilometers and about 75 degrees. Eleven kilometers, sixty degrees. Pitch. Fifteen kilometers, fifty-five. And here you can hold at forty degrees for now. At some point, the center engine turns off, but I forget if I have that action group right now. So I'm just going to shut down manually soon. The target time to apoapsis is 1 minute and 40 seconds, so we should probably moderate. Okay, right around here I'll shut down the center engine. So once we finish this stage, we should be, as long as we have time to lap lapses of 1 minute and 40 seconds, we should be alright. I'll keep the pitch to 30 degrees, but we're, we were a little bit steep this time, so keep that in mind. Okay, separation, and ignition. Now remember, the engines take a little bit of time to ignite. And you have to take that into consideration. That's why the separatrons are handy because they keep the rocket going in, uh, keep them going in the basic direction, I guess you could say, uh, and keep the fuel settled while the engines are igniting. Okay, we are going to separate the skirt now. So that's sort of how the iconic image works. And then we're going to separate the launch escape system. And off that goes because we don't need that anymore. And it's pretty heavy actually, the launch escape system is pretty heavy, you want to get rid of it rather quickly. The third stage actually finishes orbit, so the second stage is going to descend back down again. The goal of the entire launch profile is to make sure that we don't use too much from third stage such that it doesn't have enough to get us to the moon. So. The first and second stage get us most of the way to orbit, the third stage finishes orbit, and the third stage reignites to get us to the moon. And then it's up to the service propulsion system on the Apollo service module to actually make orbit around the moon. So we've got uh, that to work with. Now if you recall, just with the command module on it, the service module has about 2800 to 3000 meters per second, but it's going to have to push around the lunar module and so that's extra mass, so it doesn't really have 2,800. Um, it's going to need about 800 to get into orbit around the moon, and then the lunar module does its thing, comes back, returns to Kerbals or to Peebles into the command module, and then the 
lunar module goes away, no more lunar module, and then the command module gets boosted by the service module back home to Earth. The service module uses anywhere from 800 to 1000 meters per second to return to Earth. Orbit is at 7,800 meters per second for Earth, and what we really want to take out of the third stage is about 1,000 meters per second, so right now we're doing very well. And that's because we're not carrying as much as the Saturn V could allow us to carry. Remember, we could be carrying additional satellites in the service module, additional instruments and all that. We could be carrying a rover. We do not have our rover with us. Oh, the center engine on the third, uh, the second stage should also be shut down at some point. Um, depending on the mission that you're uh, imitating, if you will, uh, you can listen in to see when exactly they do that. I was a little bit negligent. It doesn't change our efficiency necessarily. It's just a matter of killing vibrations in the stage. It's not actually G-forces. It's a matter of keeping the stage safe because it tended to... It tend to have a lot of vibrations. Anyway, separation and ignition. The amount of delta V you need to transfer to the moon is about uh, 3,100. 3,100. So, like I said, we we can use about a thousand out of this stage in order to make orbit. And you can see if we use a thousand, we still have the 3,100 left plenty of uh, spare in fact and we only need about 600 to make orbit right now so we'll have 3,500 left which is because again we're not carrying as much cargo as we could okay we are making orbit and shut down okay 226 by 190 is fine uh, we have 3,555 meters per second lift. There will be some oil off. And so you see here the liquid hydrogen, some of it is getting used because of oil off. So that is a thing, but it won't hurt us too much. So plotting for the moon, let's just go ahead with that burn and show how that works. We don't need to go from the ascending or descending node. And in this case, it would be particularly horrible if we had to because um, the moon is too close to that end for us to make that we'd have to use a lot more delta V to do that. So we'd have to go from here, and let me just show you. So if it was an off-plane transfer, meaning that you're not at the right inclination and you have a huge difference with respect to the moon, we'd have to go with this one. And in that case, we would have to wait a little while. Uh, okay, you can see that coming up there. There we go. Something like that, and you can see 13 days for the moon periapsis. Okay, uh, we could get it closer, but there's no point. We're not gonna be doing that. But the, the worst you can expect is 14 days, and that's if you really aren't very, you know, in line with it. Um, otherwise, where you want to hit the moon is like, uh, you could say about 45 degree angle from where it is. If you just put the Earth in the middle, 45 degrees, somewhere between 30 degrees and 45 degrees. If you want to get there quickly, 30 degrees. If you want to get there a little bit more slowly, uh, 45 degrees. And so we will make our node opposite the point. Well, it uh, looks like we'll go a little bit slower for this one. So now uh, people often ask about the free return trajectory. If you're uh, going on a free return tra trajectory, that'll have to be a little bit slower than the fastest possible transfer. Uh, you know, uh, you, you could force an issue. Um, the faster you go, the faster you are getting there and the more delta v you need to slow down so keep that in mind so this is a two day and how much does this take 3177 so that's more than you'd like and if we really really want to go fast here this is one day and 14 hours you can see we've increased by uh, 200 meters per second how much delta v we need okay that's about a day uh, that costs 700 meters per second more and this isn't particularly close to the moon right now. I'm just doing this for um, an example. And we will need a very low orbit to actually land on the moon. And the delta V here to slow down and get into orbit is a whopping 3,000 meters per second. Okay? 
Now remember, uh, my plan was to try and use 800 meters per second to land. So we've only added 700 meters per second to how, how much we are using to boost out. But in forcing a uh, one day journey to the moon, we've increased the amount of delta V needed to get into orbit around the moon by many times, by almost four times. Uh, so 3000 meters per second versus 800. Okay, here we have our more normal transit, about 45 degree angle, and we are approaching the moon this way. But actually, in order to do Holman trans, uh, the sorry, free return uh, trajectory, we would want to go around the opposite direction. So not around this way. Oops. And we will increase prograde, wrap around, and approach from the other side. So now the moon is going to slow us down and bring us, uh, make sure that we keep in orbit around the Earth instead of getting ejected into interplanetary space. That would be helpful. Um, any amount of this will do. You don't have to make sure that the periapsis is all the way in Earth's atmosphere, though if you want to uh, go all finicky about it, that's doable, especially if you've got the inclination right. Yeah, I'm going to leave it off of this and just make sure that my moon periapsis is low. So, uh, whoa, that's a lot of stuff being shown. As you can see, 3,126 meters per second, and we get there in three days. Um, periapsis in four days, so that's, that's slower than the Apollo missions. And so you could get faster and try and hit over there. Uh, all you need to do is use a little bit more fuel. But again, you're gonna need a little bit more to slow down and if we check how much it takes for us to get into orbit now and again we've, we've gotten it uh, pretty close again to the surface of the moon and we want to make a very nice tight orbit it's about the same apoapsis it takes 776 meters per second like this okay we're getting close to where we need to start our burn so I'm selected node and I'm gonna use the RCS you can see these little APS packs turning us and we need to check that our propellant is very stable it is so we can ignite the engine we we have two ignitions remaining okay and here we go Okay, we're getting close to the end of the burn here, and I'm actually going to shut down the J2 engine first, but the APS pack will continue to burn to fine-tune things. Okay, so the APS pack again basically glorified RCS thrusters, and you can see that they can continue to burn. I think they've only got, well, it looks like they only have 7 meters per second, and they, they would take 12 minutes to do that, so I probably shut down the J2 too quickly. Uh, we do have one extra ignition, but it would be unfair to use that one. Uh, they never, uh, they only ignited the J2 twice in real life. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to belabor that. Rather, I'm going to talk about what else happens, and after that, we will go to stock. So, in this case, what happens is uh, we need to separate off the command and service module. Uh, well, let's try it. No, that's not the decoupler I wanted. Okay, so if things happen correctly, what would have happened is that the command and service module would separate from the rest of the stuff, turn around, grab the dock with the lunar module, and pull it out and separate from that third stage. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to do that anyway because uh, because FASA hasn't been updated the docking ports don't really work at all. They have no magnetism. Uh, though we probably could have done things better than that. Clearly we had a staging error. So yes, uh, on this note, let's turn to stock. Okay, so here we are in a stock install with just MechJeb. So there's no other mod except for MechJeb, and MechJeb is just so I can show you the Delta V statistics. Uh, so yeah. Uh, actually, let's close that for now and just talk it over. Uh, the thing about the Saturn V in stock is it makes absolutely no sense 
to do all this. It's way easier to get to the moon. You don't need all this to land on the moon, even if you're carrying three Kerbals in the command module and two in the lander. Uh, you can do it in all sorts of much easier ways. But if you insist, uh, then you, you gotta build uh, something at, like this or something better. Um, uh, don't worry, I know uh, some of you can do better than this. Uh, but let's talk over the basic features. I guess we'll start at the bottom, just like I did with the Realism, o Realism Overhaul one. So here you see five mainsail engines. The mainsails are the best analog to the F1s that we have. Uh, they, they, they feel like uh, the right kind of engine. In fact, the ISP is very close to the real one. Uh, just the thrust is scaled down by a factor of five. And um, we have the fins on the Saturn V. Uh, the Saturn V does have fins. I've limited the authority on them. Uh, to 20. They really don't need that much. Um, in fact, the Saturn V really didn't need them at all. And But, you know, actually in stock it's good to have fins sometimes. Uh, you can see the engines are sort of shifted in and moved up. And that's just for aesthetics. But if we don't have all sorts of fuel in here. Actually, you'll see I have uh, half tanks up here. Same in the center. Actually, the center has even less because uh, the center is actually, I, I wouldn't say the center has less, the center has full tanks but it's feeding out to the outside so that the, if you had the fuel flow right, I don't really have the fuel flow priority right, but if you had the fuel flow right um, then the outer ones would last longer than the center one. However, all I'm going to do is just shut off the center one. I've got that action grouped here this time. So we're going to toggle the center engine at the appropriate time if I remember and then we'll also toggle the center engine on the second stage. So here we have the second stage and I'll show you how to do the fairing thing. Um, uh, I actually learned how to do this during a live stream and uh, we'll see how that works. But yeah, um, five of the LVT-45s. It's a ridiculously sort of underpowered stage but it's actually matching the thrust weight ratio of the of the real rocket. Actually, it's better than the thrust weight ratio of the real rocket. 5 LVT 45s gives you 0.91, which is more than we had with the second stage of the Saturn V. Um, and again, uh, there are some empty tanks here, just for looks. Uh, we've got a big center tank. I... Yeah, there it is. It's a S3 7200 at the center, and that has very little fuel in it. And then these have uh, a little bit more than half and then these are completely empty so most of this stage is empty and this is why it makes very little sense because in order to make it look right uh, you basically have to make most of it empty otherwise you would end up with uh, well you wouldn't be able to get off the ground notice the thrust weight ratio of five mainsails uh, gives you 1.32 uh, compared to the actual center five's 1.14 it's uh, it's better but Anyway, uh, it's anyway. We're going for looks here. Basically, we're going for looks and the feel of it. Remember that the first and second stage both get expended on the way to orbit, and the third stage completes orbit. The third stage, going with the theme that uh, these are J2s, the LVT 45s. Then we only have one J2 in the third stage, and so we only have one LVT 45 there. That gives us a 0.60 uh, thrust weight ratio, which is pretty much spot on and that will complete orbit and it has enough left over to transfer to the moon. So, uh, it, basically exactly what we need. The complicated bits are in here. Uh, here you see uh, there is an LV-909 engine, the Terrier, as our main descent engine, and then we have a uh, Spark engine as our ascent engine on the lander. And the tanks for the ascent engine are these Oscar B fuel tanks. And uh, these are the. Uh, there's actually a tank in the middle here. There, an uh, FLT100 fuel tank in the center, and then these are attached radially on the side with fuel lines, just in case. So that's how that's set up. RCS thrusters on the main capsule. Remember, there weren't any RCS thrusters on the descent stage on the LEM, and so we don't have them here. Don't forget your batteries. Uh, that's the mechjeb part, uh, the only uh, modded part on here. 
and of course slender legs as you can see. I think that just about covers that. You can't see the delta, delta V right now, we'll do that once we uh, flip around with the command and service module and redock. Here you see uh, Rockamax X200-8 fuel tank for our LB909 Terrier for the service propulsion engine. Uh, of course on the real one the service propulsion system engine is not the same as the descent engine but uh, here we have a limited choice of engines and this made, makes the most sense. Um, the service bay, remember that uh, the service module for the Apollo mission had RCS fuel, which we have here, it had fuel cells and power, and you could probably sneak in some experiment if you wanted to add science. So if you wanted science modules in here, goo modules, or you could even put a little mini satellite that you could eject out would be a reasonable thing to do in that service bay. And then of course don't forget your heat shield, uh, RCS thrusters on the command module. Oh, uh, by the way, I've uh, reduced the thrust on these because they don't need to be too powerful and I don't want them guzzling up the, RC, uh, the RCS fuel. I've locked the mod propellants in the command pod and we've got three parachutes and then the docking port and the launch escape system. Okay, so let's take it outside and Boy, staging is going to be sort of a mess here, I'm sure. Oh, I wanted to show you how to do the fairing thing. Okay, so let's do a new craft. And let's say we've got a uh, fuel tank. We've got an engine. And a decoupler. And something much larger than the normal fairings would accommodate on the bottom. So let's say, and um, something like the stages you saw back there. So, and what I did was I underfueled these and then clipped in. Sort of like so. I'm going to temporarily shift them down a bit for convenience sake. You'll see why in a sec. So, we will build fairing. We put it as far down as possible, matching the diameter of the bottom bit. Okay, that looks about right. And then if we move to the top, if we can touch the top part, we can close fairing, as long as it's a nice round part. Right? Now, I left this gap because I want to shift this up even further. Actually, we could just shift the outer tanks now. And then you have that sort of inner stage. So here's what this looks like on launch pad. And you'll notice, obviously, it's stubbier than the real Saturn V. You could maybe, no, I, I don't think there's any good way of making it less stubby. That's, uh, well, you could try and make it taller, but um, then your thrust weight ratio would get into a bit of a pickle because the way you make it taller is by having more empty tanks. And while the delta V is not going to be a problem, you could just add more fuel to the tanks. But the thrust weight ratio will go awry because right now we only have 1.2 something or to 1.3 on launch. And if you add empty tanks, that'll probably. Uh, go a little bit too low. So there's a limit to how tall you can make this. Alright, ignition and launch. Actually, uh, for some reason the engine seemed tilted in here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. L l let me revert to vehicle. So I don't like how they're tilted in. Let me tilt them out a little bit. Like that. And also I'm going to auto strut. This, there's some auto strutting going on here. So uh, yeah, um, there's no auto strutting here. I tried to limit the amount of auto strutting because it does create some lag apparently. But yeah, there is auto strutting involved to make sure it's all together. You could use real struts if you'd like, but since we're going for looks here, probably better to just, just use auto strut. All right, here we go again. SAS on, throttle is up, ignition, and launch. You can see how little fuel we're actually carrying compared to our capacity. 
we'll try and fly basically the same sort of trajectory that we did before around Earth and that makes sense to a point because Kerbin and Earth have similar atmospheres to a point but then Earth's atmosphere in realism overhaul ends at 140 kilometers whereas Kerbin's ends at 70 so you, uh, during the later phase of the launch you have to flatten out a lot faster around Kerbin than you do around Earth. Earth you can keep that 30, uh, 20 to 30 degree up pitch and you probably have to for longer. Okay here we go. Oh I forgot to turn the center engine off again. I always do that. I always forget the center engine. Okay set. Oh! I swear that worked the last time I tried this. I tell you sometimes Kerbal. Hmm. Uh, Rockamax brand adapter crash into fairing panel. Well, geez. Let's confetti the fairings. I, I don't like them crashing into fairing panels. Alright. Let's try that again. I'll go to VAB. I tried making them into... Okay, well, the problem is we've sort of buried the fairings. Thankfully, you can select them from here now. Forget the clamshell. I think that's that was the problem, the, the clamshell fairing thing. And launch. Well, cross your fingers. Okay, and... Set. And ignition. That's how it's supposed to work. Silly clamshell fairings. Okay. No skirt set, unfortunately. We just hold this 30 degree pitch is fine. Let's get rid of the launch escape system. Not exactly as graceful as the real one. Now what comes next though isn't so much like the Saturn V. And that's unfortunately unavoidable. Well, it's avoidable, but it's complicated. So here we uh, we just heard the engines cut out, and so the second stage will be suborbital. Um, accidentally start turning a little bit too low there, so they will descend. This I mean the stage will descend as planned. So set, and now we have our one pseudo J2 engine here with RCS units just like the real one, and two little RCS tanks there to help with orientation and really we should have locked fuel up here but it's not a big deal I probably won't even use the mop pump because we have a reaction wheel something that we don't have in in realism well we don't have anything powerful like we do in stock in realism overhaul so the part that is not like real life is of course in real life it is a single continuous burn and here we're coasting to apoapsis before completing orbit so here we go. Okay, that is a decent orbit and we plot for the moon. Not all too different from the way it works in realism overhaul. About 45 degree angle, aim for it. Go ahead. Well, there's an encounter. And once again, if you want to go for a free return trajectory, you go over to the other side, and we, we could loosen up a bit. Actually, it's much easier to get a free return trajectory in stock. This is an interesting case. This is one where we hit the moon twice. We go around the moon, we go around like this, and hit it again. That is a moon cycler of some sort, which uh, would be an interesting topic for a different day. Anyway, I'm just going to leave it here as long as we have a moon periapsis. Once again, it is relatively easy to regain uh, an approach into Kerbin's atmosphere, especially in stock. As long as the moon doesn't eject you into interplanetary space, you're probably alright. And in this case, it's not that long a delay. 
Now, if we were really correct, we should have a controller on this on this stage, this third stage. Remember the Saturn instrumentation unit? Yeah, we don't have one here. Also, we've made this stage sort of stubby. Um, we would want a taller stage to really look the part, but nothing... I mean, as long as you're using the 2.5 meter capsule here, this is the diameter you need. There's no real easy way to avoid that. Okay, how much stage time do we have? Oh, we should start now. So let's have a point at the maneuver. And, well, we could pretend to settle the fuel down. Oh, well, okay, I didn't really pretend. There we go, and then ignite. Whatever. This is uh, 1.2, by the way, right now. So for realism overall part, I was in 1.1.3. We are now in KSP 1.2. Thankfully, we can throttle the engine and restart on a whim. That's always nice. And you can see how it's tightening up our current orbit as we get away from the moon. We'll go with this approach, 80 kilometers. Okay, and that does it for that. We can separate off this fairing. Not exactly how it happens in real life, but that's all right. This is the decoupler I want, not that one. Okay, and there's actually a stack separator because we don't want it attached to either bit. Okay, it does leave a little bit of residue, that, that piece. So now we want to set this target. Uh, Unfortunately, this is a time when we really ought to have had that Saturn instrumentation unit, you know, a controller down here. Because right now we can't control this bit. That does make it a little bit hard. Now, a real life challenge is, uh, you know, doing basic RCS maneuvers and dockings with as little mob propellant as possible. Um, as far as real challenges that astronauts go for, that, that's a real thing. So, just in case you uh, had something in mind, you could practice trying to do dockings with as little uh, RCS as possible. I don't do that, <laughs> if it's not obvious already. Okay, we can pull the lunar module away from the third stage. And there we are. We now have our craft bound for the moon. Oh, uh, you can start your fuel cell if you want to right here. I don't think we really have a electric charge problem, though. I suppose just for show, we'll start the fuel cell. Or one of the fuel cells. We have a backup as well. But more electric charge than we really need. So in this situation, how much delta V does the LV-909 actually have? It has uh, 681 meters per second, you can see there. Ignore the negative, that's for the lander engines, but those aren't active right now. But 681, more than enough. Actually, it's overdoing it. We could probably underfuel that, but what's the point, really? Because that'll just lighten the load for the rest of the Saturn V, and we'd have to put less fuel in the rest of it. You can see that, uh, just like with the Apollo missions, we lose communication we do not have a line of sight with Kerbin when we have to do our retro burn around the moon and so that's why they were always tense trying to figure out whether the mission had actually made orbit and of course a lot touchier in real life than it is in KSP for all sorts of reasons like selling fuel down, fuel pressures, whether the engine would actually ignite, right, uh, limited ignitions uh, there's some uncertainty whether the engine will actually have an ignition there. I mean, ignite successfully, let's say. Turns out that the engine that they used was very reliable, and the AJ-10-137, uh, and then other AJ-10s have been used for other things because they've been so reliable. Upper stage of the Delta II rocket is a different AJ-10, and of course the Space Shuttle's OMS engines, the Orbital Maneuvering System, is an AJ-10-190. Okay. I'm deliberately putting the periapsis low over there. Uh, we've got uh, 80 by 47 kilometer 
orbit. In real life, the orbit was circular, by the way. Actually, the first sprint they did, they got into a slightly elliptical orbit, and then they did a second burn to get it all circular. So, anyway, uh, here we are. Let us uh, transfer um, Jeb and Bill over into the lander can. Here again, maybe a remote controller over on this side would have been a good idea. Because Bob can't pilot. But alright, there's no fuel cell on the lander can that just has its limited battery power as it has it. RCS away. Okay, now we should be able to see the proper um, delta V's for this. Make sure we're controlling from here, yes. All right, we have 1,064 to land and uh, about 800 to get back to orbit again. More than enough, more than enough by any stretch of the imagination, even for a pinpoint landing. So it suffices, uh, even the little Oscar B fuel tanks. Just four Oscar B fuel tanks here with the Spark engine. Oh, sorry, six. Six Oscar B fuel tanks with the Spark engine and fuel lines all over the place. Here, uh, this stage has in total five FL T100s. One is the one that's attached directly to the LV909. Okay. So I'll make the landing. I won't uh, bring them back. Um, we, we'll just show the landing and how to get back into orbit again. And that'll be that. First, just bring the periapsis down here. And they they went to like maybe uh, a little bit less than 12 kilometers or something like that. To scale down, we'll go to 5 kilometers. And let's say we're trying to land in this crater. Seems like the most reasonable thing to do. Our thrust weight ratio here is much higher than for the real lunar lander. So we have a lot of we have a lot of time. The real lunar module, they really have to time things properly to make the landing safely. We'll try for a single continuous burn sort of thing. And you can actually manage where you're going to land by tilting up. So if I want to extend my orbit a little bit, I would tilt up more. So here I'm tilting up quite a lot, but this is not efficient. But that's to make sure I land at that spot. It's pretty easy to see that we could have thrust limited this engine by 50% and it would have been alright. Now if you want to do the Neil Armstrong hovering around trying to find a good place to land thing, you don't want to kill all of your horizontal velocity here. So we'll, uh, we'll point straight up and down now and sort of do the hover around thing. Okay, here we're sort of hovering over the ground, trying to find a place to land. You could do it better than this, but you get the picture. Okay, I think this is a good enough spot. So then we tilt this way. You could probably use the RCS to kill the horizontal velocity. Don't do it like that. I don't know why those lander legs are so splayed out like that. Yep. Not the best spot, it's a slope and all. Okay. So then what we would want to do is shut down this engine and just in case let me thrust limit it to zero I'm, I'm not gonna have them get out I'm just gonna show you ascent and then we are going to uh, call it a day because I think we have done quite a lot so I'll leave getting back home to you so we can throttle up uh, MechJeb when you throttle up uses the RCS but it doesn't matter okay here we go no, 
why I didn't want that. That's what I wanted. Okay. Uh, so we want to go retrograde because we did a free return trajectory sort of thing and so our our command module is going around the moon retrograde so remember that will be 270-ish. Of course we're packing quite a lot of mob propellant so we can do most of the rendezvous maneuvers with that instead. Okay, we have an apoapsis there, but perhaps we should make an orbital maneuver here. Uh, okay, actually, apoapsis seems like a good deal. Uh, or on the way down? <laughs> because I'm trying to get an uh, encounter right there. You see, uh, there we're uh, 1.7 kilometers apart. So... Again, uh, just wait until the target is a little bit ahead of you, and you could probably finagle this around the moon. It's not that hard. Um, well, with practice, you know. Not sure why it sees this as a uh, inclination maneuver. I feel like I'm doing something wrong here, but it's all right. We've got the RCS to finish this off. I think I made some mistake about the maneuver. Okay, we've got our target at about one kilometer. We could actually get to 0.6. And then I'm going to proceed with docking. So this is not a docking tutorial. I think, I think we've done what I came here to show you. So on that note, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.